I'm Sue Donarski. I'm a professor here at the Ford School and School of Education and um, a co-director of the Education Policy Initiative here at Ford. Uh, it's a pleasure to have all of you here today. Um, uh, uh, just to say quickly, the Education Policy Initiative is a program of coordinated activities. We try to be coordinated. Sometimes we're clumsy. Designed to apply rigorous research methodology to inform education policy uh, issues as well as to disseminate best practices in education reform to local, state, um, and national policymakers. And we've got uh, a series of initiatives underway, a new one that we're excited about this summer that you guys might want to think about for future summers. If you're a first year uh, student, is um, an internship with the state. Uh, so we have Michigan Data Fellows who will be um, doing work with the State Department of Education, uh, helping them analyze data and understand um, evidence uh, to drive education policy. Uh, and it even pays. So uh, we train graduate students and others to conduct cutting edge research um, and we facilitate discussion about education reform here at the university and in the larger community. So today we're very excited to have Rebecca Maynard, uh, who is university trustee chair and distinguished professor of education and social policy at Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania. Um, she recently served as commissioner of the National Center for Education Evaluation and Regional Assistance at the Institute for Education Sciences. Institute for Education Sciences funds many of the, of the, of the um, activities we have going on here um, uh, in the Education Policy Initiative. Beck is a leading expert in program evaluation, including the design and conduct of randomized controlled trials in the areas of education and social policy. Uh, throughout her career at the University of Pennsylvania, she has provided evaluation support to numerous public schools uh, and community-based organizations, as well as overseeing national evaluations of teen pregnancy prevention, home visitation programs, and vocational prep programs. Today, Becca is going to be discussing her research focused upon using evidence to guide policy and practice in education. Her presentation will be followed at about 5 o'clock by a Q&A session. All right, and I want to thank um, uh, Susan Collins, Dean of the Ford School, uh, and our other distinguished guests, and to thank the Charles H. and Susan Gessner Fund for their um, uh, general support of this event. Thanks very much. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. This is my second trip to, to Michigan and I, um, I just think this is a wonderful campus. It just has a great, um, great feel. Um, and thank you all for coming to late afternoon sessions. I don't know, Midwest seems to be different than the East. But, uh, our folks are sort of all clearing out by now. So we'll see if we can uh, keep, you, keep you awake. Um, so um, I want to talk a little bit about why the push for uh, more and better um, uh, use of evidence. Um, this is something that uh, in my time in, in Washington, I was there for a little over two years, uh, we spent uh, a good part of our energy um, worrying about how to uh, make better use of the evidence that we had and how to get more of that good um, evidence. And um, one of the reasons that this is really important is because education is really big business. We spend a lot of money in this country on education. We have 75 million students. Uh, it's about a quarter of the population. That's uh, pre-K through higher ed. We've got 10 million employees in education. That's a sizable number. So, so goes education. So goes a lot of the workforce. Um, three and a half million of those uh, individuals are K-12 teachers. We've got a million <coughs> higher ed faculty and a lot of support staff. Um, we're exceeding $800 billion annually, about 60% of this for K-12 education. Um, and that's about 6% of GDP. That's been uh, pretty stable, but going up a, a tad uh, in recent years. So this is, a, this is one reason it's important. Uh, another reason it's important to think about evidence and, and making smart decisions in this field is uh, the landscape is, is continually changing. Uh, and we've got preschool, uh, most of our kids now in, in preschool. Preschool has doubled since 1980. Um, our performance in K-12 education is just about where it was in 1970 if we take some of the standard benchmarks of performance. Um, we've got a little bit of a progress in our dropout uh, rate, but still pretty high and much higher than we'd like to have it. Um, we've seen a near doubling of the percent of students with disabilities. Students with disabilities 
uh, consume a lot of additional resources. Um, we, we do have a pretty strong commitment in this country to serving those students in appropriate uh, settings, but um, th the numbers are going up. Uh, we've had a sharp increase, really sharp increase, in the English language learner uh, uh, pop population and, um, and a, cons a massive increase in the diversity of those languages. We've got I know you've got schools out here with you know, 30, 40 languages being spoken in the schools. How do you manage that? That's a new, new challenge. Um, and we can't leave those kids behind. We've had a sharp increase in post-secondary enrollments, uh, pre and uh, post BA. Um, and a lot of this is going into the community colleges. So there's a shift in, uh, in the allocation of these students. And we've had increasing per pupil costs and declining budgets. So, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, lots of tensions around that. Uh, Adding to all of this, some of the common sense strategies that we have had for addressing some of these uh, challenges in our education system seem to have failed. Um, we've had steady increase in early education programs, but we're not seeing kids, uh, higher proportions of kids ready for kindergarten. Um, we've had expenditures per pupil rising sharply, but we haven't seen performance going up. Uh, we've had pupil, te pupil teacher ratios and pupil Staff ratios, I always get this one, which way am I going here? They're uh, getting more favorable, <laughs> so uh, fa falling. Um, and, and performance hasn't been uh, moving up with that. Teacher salaries have increased substantially beginning in the 1980s. We had a big erosion in teacher salaries, but we sort of fixed that uh, uh, in the 80s and, and into the 90s. It's leveling off a bit now, but um, that didn't that didn't do the trick either. We, we just thought we needed to pay the, the best and the brightest to come into the profession. Um, we've had massive increases in the funding for special education, partly driven by the numbers, partly driven by commitments and new ideas for how to serve that population. Uh, we have lots and lots of programs and lots of research going on and pr uh, how to deal with the ELL population. Um, we're still seeing that, that group uh, tracking very poorly. Um, and we've tried the old uh, accountability through No Child Left Behind. So we've uh, sort of upped the ante and, and changed the expectations there. So um, we've, we've, we've tried a lot of tricks and we're not sort of making any progress. So um, the next thing I think we should be trying is a little more reliance on, on evidence um, in, in, our, in our policy making. Um, and so we have some, some examples out there right now. Tiered evidence, grant making is one of the new fangled things and we have, we're putting about 140, 150 million dollars a year for the last three years into investing in innovation. Now innovation may be not quite what we're investing in, but we are in, in, in one of the nice things about this uh, tiered evidence grant making is that we are charging people, the government is charging people to look at evidence before they submit their ideas. So what do we already know? And they're also charging them to uh, make a commitment to generating some new evidence about how effective whatever it is they got funded to do was. Did it have the intended outcome? Um, so we've got the investing in innovation, which is following national priorities in terms of the, the types of st strategies we're um, funding. And we've started putting uh, $100 million a year or so into our early learning challenge grants. So these, this is money to improve the preschool uh, education system uh, through a similar kind of uh, competitive grant making where the applicants are charged with drawing down the evidence and committing to, actually in this one I have to say, um, a, after much fighting, we really didn't get a lot of evidence coming back uh, as a result of the grants. There, there will be some, but not, uh, we don't have the same quality of research built into these grants as we do in investing in uh, innovation. Um, there's a big push in government. If you haven't uh, heard about this one, this is the Pay for Success, the social impact fund and social impact bonds following the British uh, model. Um, this is basically charging the service providers to set their goals, set their targets, and the government will pay you if you achieve them. So 
that's got its own challenges. Are we setting targets that we know we can meet and that really aren't improving outcomes and we'll get paid for it? Or are we setting real targets that are going to raise the bar and, and give us better outcomes? Um, and we have started with having some evidence-linked <coughs> policy waivers. So uh, one of these has been uh, um, some waivers around uh, that allow expanded uh, eligibility for Pell Grants. So that's one that affects directly the higher eds. Um, we're hoping there's some evaluation that goes on um, with that. And uh, there are some waivers that are being given out under the um, Elementary and Secondary Education Act. So states can apply to the government on regular cycles to modify um, or have exceptions to some of the rules in return for um, a plan that is somewhat innovative, that promises to improve outcomes and that will return some evidence uh, uh, telling us whether or not, in fact, those outcomes are improving. Um, there, uh, uh, there are some facilitating uh, conditions to um, support this move towards greater reliance on, on evidence in education. One is um, uh, an expansion and an improvement, I hope, in the access to evaluation and technical assistance. Uh, some of you may know, others of you probably don't know, that there are 10 regional educational laboratories that are uh, together collectively are charged with providing uh, technical assistance and capacity uh, building for uh, all states and territories of the United States. These, these uh, labs are funded at about $5 million a year through the Institute of Education Sciences. Um, they all have strong uh, 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 research capabilities and uh, resources to partner with state and local education agencies to uh, um, improve their capacity to generate evidence and to use evidence uh, with the goal of improving outcomes. Um, there are uh, uh, a number of federally managed and funded evaluations that are continually ongoing. Uh, one of the things that happened with the establishment of the Institute of Education Sciences is that the number of such evaluations and the quality of such evaluations has uh, improved quite considerably. So I know that you folks out here have a number of projects that are funded through IES and uh, these are all highly competitive uh, projects. So uh, for those of you who don't uh, appreciate the hard work and the prestige that, and, and, and importance of these, uh, th these, are, these are very precious grants and um, the research is really uh, an, uh, important to expanding our ability to uh, act on, on evidence. Um, and uh, another facilitating condition with tight budgets and tough trade-offs, uh, this is actually an, an opportunity, uh, I, I think, to provide some incentive to, to work smarter, to work smarter. And I'll give you one of my favorite examples at the end. I'm going to save it for the end of um, uh, we are Lots of money could, be, could have been saved uh, uh, with no loss in productivity. Uh, okay, so one of the things that uh, uh, we worry about is improving the inventory and the use of evidence. So how do we, how do, we do that? And I'm going to talk about four examples here of using existing evidence smartly, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit from my own experience of how we um, have, have uh, done this and can do more of this. I'm going to talk a little bit about conducting rigorous studies to inform future policy or practice um, and uh, improving access to credible evidence about the effectiveness of programs, policies, and practices. One of the issues is if you've got to make a decision, um, it could take you a very long time to go through the education literature and um, sort the wheat from the chaff here and uh, know how do you know if you're not a, a you know, a, 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 education scientist, or uh, how do you know what's good and what's not? Um, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about making it easier to design uh, good program and, and policy evaluations. Um, so one of the um, comments I want uh, is, is learning smart use of evidence. And, and this was, I call it my mid-career awakening, when I um, went into the uh, Clinton administration thinking I was pretty smart and had done a lot of evaluation. and. Um, I was charged with uh, doing the part of his welfare reform plan that was 
uh, coming up with a cost estimate for childcare. We were going to have a change the work requirements and welfare as we know it, and we were going to put in high quality childcare so that all these mothers could go to work and we could reduce welfare. And um, <coughs> the next generation would be set to go. Um, and so the approach here was one that we have been using for years in, in just uh, normal um, policy and program management, which is simulation modeling. And, and we, we've done a lot of this where if you have a set of uh, program and policy rules that are driven by demographics, for example, uh, and, and, and income, um, things like food stamps. You can easily simulate what's going to happen if you change the eligibility rules for food stamps. You know how many people uh, there are with the family sizes and the income and so on. So you can just uh, pretty, pretty well work this one out. This was a little more complicated uh, in, in child care because we have some behavioral economics that come into this. We have the, the, the choices we get to make on the public policy front. We've got the demographics and the profile of children and what welfare is going to do to birth rates and um, marital stability and all these other things. Um, um, and then we have the, the cost accounting part. So the, the one that's really tough in here is the behavioral side of this. What, are, what, what is the response uh, pattern going to be? Um, so this is when I sort of went and looked at all the great studies that I've been working in the field of child care. So I thought I knew all the studies. And uh, as I sort of revealed this morning to a group, we hadn't asked necessarily the right questions or reported the right information uh, to uh, carry out this, this uh, policy analysis in the best way. So we were, we did the best we could. Um, so we got our unit cost by setting, we got some cross-sectional estimates about, from the labor field, about who would engage in school work or training and whether it would be full-time or part-time and for those in out-of-home activities, the numbers and ages of their kids. But wow, there were a lot of, lot of unknowns in this here model. Um, and then we had to sort of have some dynamics in here because people get jobs and lose jobs and, and uh, change in numbers and ages of children. So this, this got um, pretty, pretty messy pretty fast. And I, uh, the guilt on my shoulders is that I, uh, Clinton did not take my child care estimates, which were much, much lower and probably quite much more accurate than uh, the ones he put out. And I think probably he lost the welfare reform uh, plan uh, because he had a number on childcare that was too high. They, the administration came out estimating about 90% of these women were going to be using childcare. Was not going to be uh, the, the, the reality. Um, okay, so uh, second uh, um, aspect here is testing program effectiveness and, and how we should go about doing this. And if you read the literature, and I'll give you some statistics later. The majority of the, the research out there that purports to be telling you how effective something is doesn't really tell you how effective something is. It tells you differences or changes, or it's not a good estimate of, the, um, of, of truth there. So the test for me was when I um, took on the challenge of doing the um, impact evaluation for the Title V abstinence education program. And I got sort of. Um, a lot of chuckles from people because they, they, a lot of people just thought this was like a, a really stupid policy. And whether it was a stupid policy or not a stupid policy, um, it seemed like it was important to know um, because this was policy. This was kids' lives were being changed for better or worse or not at all. So um, the assignment that I had was to determine whether these abstinence education programs, which were funded to the tune of $50 million a year or something like that, um, were beneficial. So was, was this really a way to protect the health and well-being of adolescents? Or was it harmful? Um, or was it just money down the drain? Um, and so the, the approach here was uh, uh, to do impact evaluations of four model programs. And, uh, in doing this, um, we, we, we looked hard at what the logic model was for the program. This is sort of imp important. I'm a big believer that you have, to, you have to see it and you have to think hard about it. Is this how it's going to work? So in this uh, model, we sort of had, because this was also, I, I don't know how many of you remember, anybody here remember those battles over uh, abstinence only or comprehensive sex ed? 
yeah, they were, they were really, right? Um, so the, the, first, uh, the first meeting I went to um, on this, you know, you could get just shouted out of town um, for this. Because, of course, I took on, a, despite the fact that I was a researcher, I became, not really, but I was, people looked at me as if I must believe this is the best thing since sliced bread. As a researcher, I'm just about the science. Uh, so the logic of this is that you have these kids uh, who are sitting in these schools, and most of them are getting some kind of health and sex education, and they're going out with their friends at night, and they're getting some uh, information there, and their parents are talking to them or not talking to them, or who knows what's going on. And out at the end there, they have some behavior. So they do or don't engage in sexual activity. If they have sex, they do or don't use contraception. Um, they do or don't do it with a lot of people or a few people. Um, and depending upon those choices, then they're maybe going to have sexually tr transmitted infections or STDs, or they're going to get pregnant. If they get pregnant, they might have an abortion. They might not have an abortion. Um, and uh, so we dropped this policy change in the middle of this. And one side, the abstinence-only folks, only wanted to know, did it, did they abstain, or did they tell you they're going to abstain? Because you know we all know that we're not going to go watch them all the time. Um, so, but when you look at the logic model like this, there were sort of lots of things up there, right? That that uh, there were some, you know. People can not care about sex, but they can care about contraception. They can care, you know, they can not care about sex if you're using contraception. They can, I think we would all agree that sexually transmitted diseases are not good. Um, we probably, most of us, would agree that teen pregnancies are not good. Um, you know, the, uh, abortions, we're probably very divided on how we think about that. Um, so we could, uh, we, and, and, and then in the middle here, we've got sort of some knowledge of, of uh, uh, sexual health and some values and intentions in here. Now, imagine if what we do, one argument is, is if we give kids a clear message, they will, that's the best chance of getting to, them to the end game. But that means we can't tell them anything about contraception. We, can't, we can tell them a lot about S, STIs, STDs. Uh, we probably should stay clear of the abortion or tell them only that it's bad. Um, now we've got some kids out there who maybe get that message, but then they somehow get someplace and have sex, and so they may end up uh, not using contraception because they never heard of it, whereas if we hadn't done this abstinence thing, they might have heard of it. So we might have, we, we, we could change, we, actually we've got sort of two things going on here, right? We could change the, the probability of having sex and we could also change the probability of using contraception and they probably go in opposite directions uh, if, the, if the program is, is working right. So who knows what, we could, we could get some good things and some bad things or all good or all bad. Okay, so that said to me that I was only gonna do this study if we went for truth. I wanted to get the best estimates I could of the likely impacts on all of those outcomes that we just showed you, good, the bad, and the ones we can disagree about. Um, and depending upon truth, whatever we learned about this, I wanted to be able to feed back something to that logic model to sort of say, okay, so this is really how it works. You know, if you teach them about abstinence, yeah, some of them will not do it more, you know, a few will get a reduction in teen sexual activity, maybe they won't have as many partners, but if they have sex, they're not going to have contraception or whatever it is. I wanted to be able to not only know what happened on those outcomes out there, but I wanted to understand a little bit more about what was going on in the middle. Never cared so much about understanding inside the black box uh, as in this one because it was, it's really important. I mean, the kids are at the end, so there's an answer to this. This, this is good, bad, or indifferent. So the strategy was I, I would only agree to do this study in those places where we could do randomization because I believe that is the only way we can control for self-selection and get a good unbiased estimate of impacts. Um, and we did parallel studies of four programs that varied by age group, approach, and counterfactual. So we had uh, a mix here. And um, the findings, hmm, some of you probably read to the bottom, 
changed attitudes and intentions, at least as reported to us, did not change behaviors one iota. Four programs, zero, 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 okay? <laughs> on all of those outcomes over there, okay? It didn't matter. So whatever's going on out there was bigger. Now, if we had not done this experiment, I can tell you that the people who liked the answer, and we probably would have gotten some positive, you know, we would have gotten some, we wouldn't have gotten all zeros. Um, the people who liked it would have said, I did a great study. And the people who didn't like it, those of you who didn't like whatever I found, are going to tell me that my study was flawed. That's what would happen, right? That would be the, the truth. So this was really important to do this study so that right or wrong, Jeff Smith and Sue Donarski, Steve Hammett, they're gonna, say, they're gonna stand behind me and say, you should, you should take these results seriously. Um, so the reason we did this experiment, stakes were high, kids' health and welfare were at stake. It's a politically charged is issue. And findings from any other design were just gonna be fodder for the, for the um, political debates and battles here. Um, and the setting was right. There was insufficient capacity to treat all students. Okay, this was a demonstration project, $50 million a year. That wasn't gonna do any, everything for all the students everywhere. So we could have just put the money out there and learned nothing. Instead, what we said, you want the money? Help us learn something. And if you're right, we'll learn that. If you're wrong, you know, we're not gonna chastise you for it. We're gonna sort of celebrate the fact that you helped us learn that you were wrong and we hope that you will feed that back into your programming so that, uh, you know, uh, my argument to the people who, who, who love this abstinence was you don't have to give up on abstinence if this doesn't work. But if this doesn't work, you, you want to know that because that's what you're trying to achieve. And you don't want to work, you know, 16 hours a day doing something that's not having any impact or having the opposite impact. Okay. Third thing I want to talk about is how we organize evidence for efficient and smart use. Um, so how do we know what works, what doesn't work? Too often we want to look just for what works, and we don't want to look at what doesn't work. And when don't we know? I mean, sometimes we just don't know. We never ask the question. And there's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't make us bad people. It just means we, we need to make a decision absent evidence. And we ought to know that that's what we're doing. We're making a smart decision based on you know, our hunch, um, our beliefs, whatever. So what we need is systems for searching, sifting, rating, and summarizing evidence in education. And uh, you know, this got started in the medical field. The medical field had something called the Cochrane Collaboration. Your doctors, my doctors, all use this. They, they want to know how effective a certain drug is. They log into the internet and go to the Cochrane Collaboration. So about maybe now 15 years ago, um, it, folks in education started the Campbell Collaboration, which was education, social welfare, crime and justice, modeled on the same thing, which is to do a little sifting and sorting and summarizing of evidence. This got picked up when IES was, was founded. Russ Whitehurst, who was the first director, um, took on a mission of creating something called the What Works Clearinghouse. And my only wish is that it would say what works and doesn't work, but it's, but it's, it's catchier if we say the WWC or the What Works Clearinghouse. Um, and this is now, uh, I think, a very um, useful source of information that it's not perfect yet. And it's going to be continuing to evolve, but it is certainly an improvement over what we had and establishes some standards. So just to set the stage, I want to show you the, the uh, results of a um, study that we did <coughs> under the, it was sort of bridging the Campbell and What Works Clearinghouse, um, where we did a full scan of literature over 20 years, which is sort of what's typical. If you go more than 20 years, you have to think hard about whether the context is still right. And for some things, 20 years may be too long. But, um, and what all of these models have in common is that they use consistent standards of evidence, uh, them, that are specific to study design. They review and code the studies so that everything is sort of easily retrievable. If you ever tried to read a lot of journals, you get the stuff every which where, footnotes, endnotes, tables, omissions. Um, and then we have uh, products that include like the, the original database, which until recently was not public. 
um, intervention reports, practice guides, and technical reports and tools. So there's a lot of stuff up there that will help um, both help feed information, make it readily accessible, and help those of us who are producing information do a better job of um, designing our studies, reporting our studies, and sharing our information. So in this study that, that uh, we did of uh, college access program, we, we, we did this sort of, as I said, in parallel. We looked at literature since 1990. We used the What Works Evidence Standards. Um, we coded the data in a similar way to what works, and here's some, you know, just an interesting fact. So you, we, we went to the library, we got 2,044 hits, okay? This is studies that sort of looked like they would be impact studies. The title and, the, and or the abstract would lead you to believe they're going to give you some estimate of the effectiveness of a study. Um, some of them we screened out because they just weren't, once we looked a little closer, they weren't that. 200 past face relevance after we sort of read it, we sort of said, yeah, this is what it is. Go down here in the little corner down here, 14 studies were what, I mean, we, and we didn't go for gold standard studies. These were studies that we, we could say, you know, probably have some causal validity. So we should, we should pay attention to the results. That's an incredible uh, bunch of studies and time and energy that have been put into doing research and publishing research, because this is published stuff, I didn't pull it out of people's drawers, um, that, that didn't answer the question, um, even remotely, or I would not want my policymaker um, acting on this, I would not my, want my children's education be, be, to be based on this research. So what we got, not surprisingly, is um, these are, these are the centers of these little boxes are the point estimates of the impacts and the little bars on the side give you a 95% confidence interval around that. So for those of you who are uh, comfortable with, with confidence intervals. So this just shows you that there's a range of, of uh, impact estimates. Upward bound down here, this is the, the big um, federal program. No effect. Um, and now we won't let it be evaluated <coughs> again. That's a big... Uh, always a big political fight over whether or not that program can be evaluated, even though it serves less than 7% of the eligible students. Okay, so it's uh, lots of room out there to know whether this is a good thing. Okay, so what we've done with this is we now have a shared evidence platform though called the What Works Clearinghouse. Um, then this is contracted out, the IES contracts this out. Uh, there are now two nodes to this. There used to be one, but the, all the data, from your perspective, all the data are in one place. Um, it has uh, uh, sort of three, three parts to it. It has the individual studies or inter uh, of intervention effectiveness. So this is the source. This is what the researchers produce. Then the clearinghouse takes it, sorts it, sifts it, finds the evidence that is credible by some standards that I think... Uh, you know, we, we have, have stood the test of time. They've been out there now for about uh, eight years, and they've had a lot of fighting over them over the years, but I think they've settled down. People are not, you know, we, we all have our own judgment about whether they're too lax or too tough, but they sort of seem to be striking a balance. And so we have, these studies get reviewed according to a consistent protocol and uh, put into a nice, neat format, and there's a, there's a library of these studies. And one of the things I feel the best about my time in Washington is these studies are now available to you. You have to request them, but you can take these coded studies out and you reuse them if you are doing a literature review. Um, and then there are a series of reports that summarize the results of the uh, evidence. There are single study reports. That's another thing that we instituted. We used to, when we just reviewed one study, we used to just put it in the file drawer and we'll give you a little blurb on your computer that tells you what, uh, uh, what, what, we, what we found. Uh, but now we actually publish the results of those single study reviews. We tell you whether the evidence is credible or not, uh, how highly credible it is. We tell you what was found uh, in, in that and give you the um, d d descriptive background on it. Um, we also have uh, in there intervention reports which summarize have all the evidence on a given intervention. So something like, um, you know, cognitive tutor or Met read 180. You'll, you can go in and you can find all the evidence that the clearinghouse found up to a certain point, sorted by whether or not it's credible, how, if it's credible, 
how credible it is, and then the findings summarized. Um, and then we've turned some of that into practice guides, so that uh, the practice guides are intended to be a bridge between the, the evidence on what it does and doesn't work and uh, what one might do if you are actually in the classroom or in the school building uh, having to make decisions on a daily basis. So um, uh, one of the most useful parts of the practice guides, I think, is telling you where there is no evidence um, to support a particular policy, but practitioners think this is the best way to go. But adopt this policy or practice knowing that we, we have not um, demonstrated this with, with evidence. And then there are a lot of uh, tools in there. Um, one, of the, one of the most recent things that was added to the What Works uh, site, and this is the one that was the turning point between not being useful and being useful, was <laughs> something called the Find What Works tool. You know, we've got all these, we're supposed to be doing this to support policy making, and, and I'm getting calls from, from the help committee, um, and they, you know, they just want to know what the most effective education policies are, rank them one to 50. So we finally got them to understand that we needed to be able to query this database a little more in a little more nuanced way. But we've done it in a way that I think um, is very supportive of policy. So uh, now what you can do, you can go in and you can uh, create summaries of the evidence of all the studies that we have, um, that have been uh, reviewed and summarized. Um, you can filter it by topic. So do you want to know about math? Do you want to know about reading? Um, do you want to know about a particular outcome like uh, dropping out of school or going to college or um, achieving proficiency or um, behave, being, being well behaved in the classroom. You can sort it by grade, so you may want to, you may be focused on preschoolers or you may be focused on high schoolers. So there's a large, large part of this database that is not relevant to you or uh, depending upon what your perspective is. Um, you can sort by findings. You could say, I want all the stuff on the English language learner populations that have positive effects or negative effects. You may be looking for the negative effects. Um, and you can also look for it by extent of evidence. You say, I only want to look at interventions that have been tested on a large, you know, that have a large body of evidence and that have been shown to improve either math or reading. So you can, you can put in more complex uh, scenarios here. Um, S and, and this will also give you, when you do this, you probably can't see this, but in these circles here, like if I picked uh, population groups, it will also tell me over in the far side how many studies um, there, there are that, uh, in, that, in that bucket. So you, you could you get a little snippet of that. Um, and then you can pull up and get a, get a quick summary of sort of what the evidence shows. So that's what's, that's what's going on over here. So we've got, uh, this is the results um, for uh, general academic achievement. So that's what we've, we've sorted on here. And it will just, you can, you can sort it by the size of the effects, or you can sort it by the extent of evidence, or, um, and, it, and, and if I could, if this were live, um, we could just scroll down and see all the studies, uh, all the interventions, I'm sorry, all the interventions. So what is in here is within each of these headings, uh, this one's lessons in character. That is a branded intervention. So it's summarized all the studies of lessons in character on that outcome measure, which is uh, general academic achievement. And it will tell you that in this case, there's a uh, positive effect, that it, uh, but there's only a small body of evidence. So we don't have very many studies, but it is positive. Um, OK, so the last thing I want to talk about is uh, building a culture of evidence-guided policy and practice, because this is, this is really where my, my passion is. I just think uh, we are. Uh, s spending too much and the stakes are too high to not know. So here's just my favorite example. I promise you an example. Uh, West Virginia schools acted without evidence here. So if you could read this, and you can't read this, but it says, use of math software in West Virginia schools doesn't add up. Then it says, the US Department of Education finds no discernible effects in raising test scores. Um, state reviews are mixed. And what if this is the state of Virginia went and bought a computer-based math curriculum for all the high schools in the state. And they put it in place. And they trained the teachers. I don't know. It may work in Virginia, West Virginia. But in the 
studies that have been conducted by uh, you know, s talented researchers, published and passed the What Works Clearinghouse standards for causal inference evidence. The bottom line is there's no evidence that this program works. So um, what could and what, you know, it seems like the first thing you could have done is they could have gone to the clearinghouse. Now, in fairness to them, we didn't have the What Works tool up and running until, uh, so it would have been hard for them to do what we can do now um, 18 months ago, maybe even a little bit less than that. Um, but now they could, they could certainly do that. Um, they could have com contacted the, we also have comprehensive centers. The Department of Education has comprehensive centers, which are also charged with providing support to state and local uh, education agencies, uh, or regional education lab, uh, which uh, are, are intended to pr provide this kind of support. Could have contacted one of you folks and sort of asked you what you know what what you knew what the evidence was. So even if West Virginia found the evidence <coughs> and they said you know no effects, they could have decided that they're different and this is a good fit for their schools, but they wouldn't really know that. They wouldn't really know that. So what would have been a smarter thing to do? Maybe try it out, right? They could have tried it out in some schools or with some classes, and they could have gone to their local university or gone to the RAL or gone to the comp center and gotten somebody to help them learn from their experience. My guess is they did a not such a good job training all the teachers in how to use this, doing it all at once, right? They might have done a better job if they'd done a quarter of them or 10% of them. And if they did one more thing, they selected the schools that are going to be the early adopters with a flip of a coin, they could have learned something really important. They could have learned something about, they could have learned several things important. They could have learned, uh, number one, whether or not this is actually improving math achievement for their students before they go and buy lots more Carnegie, to, it's, the Car, yeah, it's the Car, Carnegie Cognitive Tutor. Um, they, they, they could have, um, they could have also gotten some purchase on how to do the training efficiently. You know, they might have been able to uh, improve the training. Mo most of us, the first time we go out and do some kind of training, go home and sort of say, hmm, I think I could have done that better. You know, let me, let me incorporate all those questions and, um, that I was asked. So it just feels like this is, a, this is a, a case where, you know, a couple of steps here, they could have saved a lot of money. I think they spent uh, $20 million on, on that uh, software for the whole state. So, okay. Um, so building a culture that encourages creation and use of evidence. So using evidence in decision making, I, I would say, number one, look for reliable sources. Um, search for evidence and, and use phased implementation when you, when you can't. Uh, you know, it, it just, it's, it stuns me that we can't get um, uh, Congress to do more uh, phased implementation. We did this actually in welfare reform. We did some of the, uh, what we did is when, when we did the big welfare reforms of, when was it, 96, we allowed a lot of waivers. Um, so states could come in and say, I've got a better idea. So if you let me do this, uh, the quid pro quo was the, the feds let them change the rules but they had to do an experimental evaluation of it. So they couldn't do it with everybody. So they could um, you know, relax the mandatory work requirements, for example. Um, but the, the, the quid pro quo was you can do that, but you have to do an experiment. And if it isn't effective, if what you're doing is not better than our new policy, you have to stop doing it. So uh, we could do more of that in education. It would seem so smart to do that. Um, and we could do strategic, you know, pilot testing. We could just, uh, you know, ro roll out programs uh, over time. I don't know why we, um, I mean, the state of Maine gave every seventh grader a, a notebook computer all at once, same year, same year. You know, didn't think about things like what the kids were going to do with those internet connected laptop computers, seventh graders, right? They didn't think about what was going to happen in the households when there's fighting between mom and dad about, uh, getting what's going to happen when the computer gets dropped? How are the teachers going to use these computers? Every student in the state of Maine, all at once, 
What if they had phased that in? They could have, you know, they, their investment would have been made over a number of years. They would have learned some things about how to implement it, how to bring parents into the process. Well, go figure. Um, so, uh, so the, the challenge, there are some challenges in doing, uh, you know, local evaluations and, and having, not having big national firms. I mean, you know, nobody can afford to do, um, you know, these multi-million dollar evaluations of IES funds. Um, but state governments, local school districts could do a whole lot more. You don't have to have a study with 3,000 observations for it to be useful because if you did a study in one school with 50 observations and it was well designed and you did it in another school and another school and you could put those together, right? Uh, in the state of Michigan, you have all the same tests for all the kids. Data is cheap, right? You got the, you got the outcome measures coming in already. Um, all you have to do is sort of roll these things out uh, in a way that you can get reliable comparison of treated and untreated um, kids. Um, okay, I'm going to just, uh, these are some things that are a little bit more, I'm going to skip those, I think. I just want to end with a couple of examples of high value, low cost evaluations, because I think this is where the future is. Um, I think we, we can be doing a lot more uh, evaluations that are na more narrowly focused, you know, you're not going to know everything about everybody, but, um, uh, you know, Pell Grant experimental initiatives. Here's where we're changing the rules on Pell Grants. Well, what if we didn't change the rules for everybody, or we change the rules for everybody, but we allow some, uh, some backing out of that for people who have better ideas? But the rule is we do this randomly. You know, increase the amount, um, increase the duration, forgiveness policies, whatever it is. Um, we're just starting to design, uh, or when I left, we were just starting to design some experimental initiatives that would be around allowing some flexibility in the rules changes, but the quid pro quo is you got to study it. Um, the FAFSA completion study that uh, um, Bridget Terry Long and, and um, uh, uh, Bettinger did, um, you know, randomly assigning families to get H&R Block to pre-populate the FAFSA form for uh, uh, eligible students. Uh, that was very low cost, because all they had to do is plug into the national database to get the outcome measures. Uh, positive parenting program, this is where they randomly assigned counties, and when, then you can plug into administrative data to get outcome measures. So you don't get all the details of what went on and how it was implemented, but sometimes you can add that on, especially if you can engage graduate students or regional labs or get a foundation to add, add the icing. Um, New York City teacher incentive program, we randomly assigned schools to either get these incentives or not get these incentives. All we had to do was watch whether the teachers um, move more, whether the students do better. Um, all the data were there to, to monitor the outcomes. So, you know, the, it, it is possible to do this, and I think it would be really smart of us to just uh, get, on the, get on the train here and uh, have, uh, you know, more partnerships with schools and the higher eds and make better use of this administrative data. So let me stop there, give us time for um, um, questions. Nobody has any questions. Yes. Yeah. So I like this idea about creating a culture of evidence-based culture. But you, didn't mention, you, you mentioned what evidence-based culture could do but you didn't offer any proposals for how one would go about creating a evidence-based culture in an agency. Let's say I'm the new governor of West Virginia, and I've seen your talk, and I'm outraged that we wasted all this money on this math program, and I want to create an evidence-based culture in my State Department of Education. What would you tell that person to do? I would, I would, uh, you know, I'd want to be in your office um, a lot, and I'd want to encourage you to sort of introduce me to all, you know, when you've got these new, problems or initiatives, I think we ought to be both expecting and to some extent incenting people. One thing, actually, a key to having an evidence-based culture is to make it safe for people to participate in evaluations. Uh, you know, I don't, I think everybody who goes out and does something that they think is going to be, like buying that software, somebody thought that was a good idea. So if we did the, if we had not bought it every place and we had done the study and we found out that was right, it really wasn't a good idea, I don't want those people who thought it was a good idea for, they had good reasons. I don't want them to feel like, um, you know, I think they're stupid or incompetent or irresponsible. 
I want them to, what, what, would disip, what I want to do is I want to encourage them to take the, that knowledge as just that knowledge and then um, use that in the next decision that they make, you know, to, 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 I mean, don't hunker down and say, by gosh, I want to do this. So I think we have to make it, there has to be a give back. And the give back is, you know, A, you don't have to do this all at once, B, you'll learn something, and, uh, you know, I'm still on your team. You know, I still, I still want to help. Uh, and I think too often we think we're if, if I created the program, you know, if I'm the one who came up with this abstinence only program, I better be right. How am I going to feel when it's wrong? I'm going to, it's got to be okay to be, you know, I thought it was a good idea. Respect me for that. And, um, and, and, and when, you, when I want to start pushing back is if somebody, you know, refuses to accept the evidence as real evidence and learn from it. I, I like to put the, t I think we're putting the child at the center and sort of saying, this is not about you or me or our careers. This is about we're all trying to get the best for the kid. So let's try to learn. And if it works, build on it. If it doesn't work, it was a good idea. You know, somebody thought it was a good idea. Somebody funded it. So, you know, it's more than one person, right? So let's not get in a fight about that. Let's sort of move on and figure out if not that, then what? So I don't know if that answers your question, but I, it's hard. I think it's really hard, but I think researchers have a part. I think we have a part to play in this. We have been arrogant. We have been inattentive to what the, you know, the, the, the policymakers and the program people need. You know, it was like, I mean, how many researchers do you know who uh, don't publish the results if they don't come out the way they wanted? They keep redoing their model or put it in the file drawer. I mean, this is a group that is, this is not a random sample of, of researchers in this room. So I, I think we are underrepresenting that group, but the publication bias is pretty large out there. There are journals that won't, won't publish papers if they're not significant findings in the right direction. I can tell you if I went to family planning perspectives and tried to publish an article that said uh, abstinence education worked, would, they wouldn't even look at, at how I did the study. That would be, that would not, that would be a no-go. I, I guess I would respond, I, I don't want to monopolize you, but I, I guess to me this is an area where we actually need to do some research, uh, in a sense. That, like, I do yeah. consulting internationally, and I observe that there's some countries that seem to have this evidence-based culture thing happening at the national level, and there's yeah. some countries that don't. It's a small end problem, so it's easy to sort of speculate and say, well, you know, the, the, the do have this in common and the don't have that in common. But you could use state level variation yep. uh, mm -hmm. across states. You could use department level variation within a state, right? Maybe like under the Bush 2 administration, arguably, education department was really enthusiastic and very serious about evidence. Department of Labor. Right, not right, so it much. changes. Why yeah. was that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's a good, um, um, a good point. and say, you know, here's a great practice guide. And they'd say, this is great. What I really want to know about is question X. And question X wouldn't be represented in the World Works Clearinghouse. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the two-way street of dissemination in order to frame the conversation, um, as well as responding to the needs of the questions that are really um, relevant to or pertinent to practitioners or policy Yeah. Um and that's a really that's a really great question, and it it, it is actually one of the roles that the, the labs are supposed to be um, facilitating that, making sure. So one of their one of their charges is to do need sensing, so that they know what information is front and center uh, at the local level. I think part of this is we as researchers have to have to be more engaged with our our clients. So when I when I take on a new uh, project. Now, and I learned this halfway through, I didn't, or maybe three quarters of the way through where my career, I didn't do this at the outset, but I, I, it's always a partnership. I mean, I want to, and I have to, I feel like I have to sit down with you and have a conversation about what you need to, what you need to know, what makes this worthwhile for you, as well as, you know, I'm going to have a slightly bigger, uh, you know, I want, I care about that, but I also care about sort of the larger landscape and what would be useful to places beyond my local 
um, my local sites. I also think there's an education that has to go on with the practitioners to accept that sometimes the answer is we really don't know. So your judgment is as good as any evidence I can give you. The, the research hasn't been done. And that's, uh, I think it's better to tell you that, if that's the truth, than it is to give you some evidence that isn't reliable. A lot of evidence is not reliable. You know, people put stuff out there and it's promotional, it's, um, you know, just poorly designed, not good evidence. And I think having that honesty about what we do know, what we don't know, uh, and then sort of coming back and sort of saying, well, I know this is what you want to know, but I've done a scan, there is no evidence. One way or the other, here's what we can tell you. We might want to think about building some in. As you, uh, that would be how I would approach that. Yes? To bring the perspective of the school board member, not the researcher. Mm -hmm. And this is a, it's very interesting and I think very helpful. I'm going to try it out. But I'm wondering if there is another component to it. Um, I have a model in my mind, so I'll say the model. Mm -hmm. But the cooperative extension service is one of the really astounding institutions mm -hmm. that change an entire sector yep. uh, in combination with the research enterprise. And one of the key things in that was that the extension people, along with scientists, got local farmers yep. to try things. Yes. And I, as a school board member, going to come back to that now. I trust going to another school or district and seeing it work, talk with people more than I do a paper, even if it's on some clearinghouse website that says this is terrific, 1,800 yeah. people say it's terrific. I still want to go see it work because I have that skepticism that you concluded your last answer with. And I think there's something valid about going next door and seeing if indeed the wheat really didn't get rust. Yeah. And everybody else's wheat did. So maybe I should change my direction. I, I think that's a, you know, that is a great, um, <coughs> Um, you know, reference to, I think, the extension service. I, in an ideal world, the labs would be sort of the, a, a piece, they would be like the, the regional offices of the extension, where, and we folks, you know, your uni local universities, and uh, would be more like the agents who are going to be working with the, uh, you know, with the schools to help them when they try these new things out, actually do it in a way that they will you know they can they can sense whether or not the rust is really there or not there because sometimes we don't we don't see the the outcomes that we see uh, you know we, maybe the demographics of the schools are changing so the the performance is going up or down depending upon which way the the currents are going so it does help to have so so your analogy of the agents who are actually working with the farmers to do the studies you know do the experiments if you will. Um, that is exactly what I think would be um, so helpful, and it would build and it would build these conversations. You know, we researchers are much better researchers when we are engaged with the practitioners when they are on our team. It's not me coming in and studying your school. It is uh, me coming in, sitting down with you, and we together are going to address the issues that 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 you have. And I have to do it in a way that is sensitive to what's going on in the school and that will give us evidence that you, you can believe. So I've, I've got some trust building, that, and, and we as researchers have trust building to do, and a lot to learn because the textbooks uh, take us so far. They're necessary, train, part of the training, but they're not all of the training. Um, you know, that's a, that's a good point. Sometimes, it, sometimes you'll know that and sometimes you won't. Um, so I think that's a, you know, that's a, that's a useful comment. And yeah, 
I think that's a very I useful. See the field. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think that, yeah, I, yes. I will note that decision made after I left. Uh, but I know that during my, my time there, the, the, the struggle that we would face in trying to bring a uh, rigor in the conversation was that's a, a deliberative process and can take a, a good amount of time. And a state policy environment can also can often be very time constrained. Yeah. And so if uh, a governor decides to take an initiative and wants an answer something in six weeks, then we're going to push ahead with. Uh, this new uh, policy initiative, if they could come to us and say, we'd really like to know the yep. evidence on this, and we say, well, we'll get back in 18 months. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really You're work right. to address their needs. So I'd be interested in your insights on navigating the, the needs for a deliberative process and having good, solid evidence for an intervention with the uh, often time-bound needs of policymakers at the state level. I, I think that's, that's one of the reasons that I think it's so important to have some of this stuff pre-sifted and sorted. So, you know, these, all of these, uh, uh, if you go to the clearinghouse, the reports are different ages. Some of them will be back to, you know, 2006. Some of them will be 2012. Um, so there may, there may still be a little bit to do. But I think, it, it, you know, the more, if we get all of us putting our evidence in there, okay, and we start contributing to that, then it's really quick for you to go and, and, and respond, number one, what do we know already, right? That doesn't take you a long time. And if we don't know what is needed, I, I think it's okay to say we don't know. And I think that's better than sort of saying, you know, here's some not so good research that may, may be as wrong as it is right. I mean, I think that's the, that's the part that there is a lot of stuff out there masquerading as science and it is not really scientific. You know, those people in this room would not, would not look at this and want their children's uh, education being guided by uh, that evidence. So I, I think this is, I, I think we have to make it okay for people to do innovative things. The world has to go on, right? We can't do nothing and, and be sanguine about things, but I would just encourage them to try to you know, when, if you're going to take a bold step and do something, be open to learning from doing that. And, and it doesn't, you know, especially when you can do it at low cost. And with, with the new data systems and the standardizing of tests and so on, you can get those top level outcomes really at, at very low cost in, very, in a very timely way. If you build these partnerships, draw on the RELs, draw on the, the talents in this room, um, you know, it's, um, and there are, there are um, you know, people all over the country now. Ten years ago, there were not people all over the country who understood these issues and who could help a local education organization do a low-cost study. They just, they just weren't there. They were concentrated in a few firms and a few large universities. Um, we now have lots of folks like you who have had some of this experience in a regional lab or in a university or at a research firm um, who, and we're training people through things like this, the IES pre-doc program and this seminar series that you run. Um, so I think there's a lot more capacity out there now to do that. I just don't think we should mix up good evidence with, with not good evidence. I think it's okay to say we don't have it. Yes? I want to pick up on an earlier question. Um, in, in response to a number of questions, you've been kind of playing out a theory based upon um, your experience in collaborating with a variety of, um, of policymakers, and um, I'm wondering how you, how we might go about learning from that theory that you're playing out based on your own practice in an evidence-based way. How do we learn about the ways in which um, researchers productively collaborate? With policymakers at different levels of the system and different um, uh, different contexts, how do we learn about that? Well, there's there is an, an initiative that is jointly sponsored by WT Grant Foundation and Spencer, uh, going on now, which is on use of evidence. Um, and there are I, I don't know five or six teams. Somebody here may know better than I do. I uh, was involved in it when it was first starting, and I was doing work with with WT Grant. 
Um, I've seen some of the early results of that. I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's hard work, uh, and it's going to think it's going to take us a while. But it's picking up on Jeff's point too. I think we need to, uh, we need to learn more about that. I can tell you that. Um, it is getting a lot, lot easier for people to, uh, to, to engage with schools, school personnel, policymakers, um, and, and, and embark on these kinds of knowledge development, knowledge use enterprises. Um, so it's, uh, you know, the, the number of people here at Michigan who have been out doing um, <coughs> research with the schools uh, says that, you know, it is getting out there, the, the art and the uh, strategies, I think part of it is uh, experience on both sides. So I know a lot of times it helps. When, one of my first things I do is I sort of make sure that I connect with the policymaker or the practitioner that I'm communicating with on doing something. I want them to know other people who have worked with me in similar capacities and how we have worked. So sharing those kinds of um, experiences and relating other, I mean, there's, there's probably not many unique situations somebody could, you know, or objections to the evidence uh, uh, generation or process that somebody could throw at me that I couldn't relate to some other uh, encounter and have some strategy that we had made work. I, uh, so the point I'm asking you is how do we study that very practice that you're describing right now? You're theorizing about relationships. Oh, that's a good, well, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, you'd, you'd have to have more than, than the end of me to do that. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I think there are enough of us out there doing this now that I think you could, you could, somebody could probably do that. They could probably, you know, create a sample of us and how we are approaching it and when we're, when we're, being more successful and less successful, but um, I, th I don't know. It's a good dissertation uh, <laughs> topic for somebody. Um, do you have any suggestions, or you? Hmm. Uh, at the moment, I'll just, I'll just raise it as a question. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a, I think it's a good question, yeah, it and, and, and bottling it to, you know, to, to sort of share with people too. I think is, a, is another thing that is, you know, it is uh, important. I think the IES pre-doc program has been one way that people have been getting you know, the, the, the art, if you will, the art of this science out there um, because we do a lot of, you know, cross-communication and sharing of experiences, sitting, sitting on uh, technical work groups so, so we learn what other people, what problems they encounter and how they um, get around it. But, but you've, you rightly identified we, we aren't uh, formally studying it in that way. We're not studying the negotiating. We are, there are these efforts, as I said, to study the use of evidence and what distinguishes when it is being used and for what purposes and how do we facilitate that process. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Diane Sal and I work with your colleague Ken Gertz. Uh -huh. a study from, funded by the WT Grant Foundation of state education agencies use of evidence. Um, and one of, just to answer some of your questions, they are doing some action research partnerships and studies right now so they've just launched that. But the other, um, the other thing I was going to say is that when researchers come to these state education agencies or when they're trying to get ideas about how to proceed, one of the questions they ask themselves is, is the context like mine, similar to what Glenn was mm -hmm. saying, the school board member up there, you know, I want to see it in action. Is this in a setting that looks like me? How do I translate these research findings mm -hmm. into my context? So there's a lot of, uh, so the researchers that are sitting at the table or who are at the table when they're discussing these issues are, have more um, access to the, uh, to applying research at the moment of the, you know, when the, the questions are arising at the table, when they're trying to do that translation process. So one question I had is whether um, you've thought about those issues of context. Because mm -hmm. that's really high on their, right. on their thought and their thinking process. Yeah, so we, um, I mean, that's always a key part of, you know, wanting a well-designed and, and executed study would, would certainly have a good bit of contextual information 
uh, as part of it. The clearing, the Wetworks Clearinghouse does describe the context. So if you find something that looks interesting to you or something that's counter, you wanted to do it but it says no work, you can actually read in the reports that they have summar I mean, where they've summarized what the context is. So this was, you know, uh, you know, a large urban poor school district, or this was a suburban school district, or this was, uh, you know, a place that had a whole highly paid teachers. So you can get a lot of that context there. It's not perfect, but that's part of how deep and how broad is the is the evidence you're drawing on. And again, knowing whether whether you um, have it or don't have it. So I would say, you know, it would be foolish to say go to the clearinghouse. If it's you know it gets thumbs up or thumbs down, you should you should look use that as a piece of it is evidence and it has been through some screen and you know in some areas you know more and other areas less about the context in which the the research was was done. Um, you know we have some some areas of research where there have been large multi-site um, evaluations. So the upward bound study, the federal evaluation of upward bound and Job Corps were both nationally representative samples. Okay, so. I, again, that they, there's some heterogeneity in the, in the results, so maybe you are at the extreme of the overall results are pretty modest to null. Maybe you're different, and maybe this would work for you, and maybe you look like that outlier that had the positive effects. You know, there's no study is going to give you all of that, but I think if you, um, you know, go into the reports and, and, and scan them, I think you will find some of that there, and you won't be left, you know, just out at sea without an oar. Well, I think it. I mean, I think it depends. You know, there are policymakers. There were policymakers at every. I mean, there's a, a teacher is a policymaker in a in the in the classroom, and a principal is a policymaker at another level. And so, you know, there are all these layers. And I think sometimes people, you know, if you're making the decision in West Virginia, they were making the decision for the state. So that's a pretty broad uh, policy context. You might have, uh, you know, there might be different decisions for the high-performing school in the suburbs versus the inner-city school. So it really depends, I think, where is the where is the decision making occurring, and then the context, uh, you know, maybe broader or narrower depending upon that. Um, Jeff, you had mentioned that. That there's more of uh, this type of investigation going on. One of the constraints has been in education is the, the question of uh, selection or uh, the ethics of who's going to participate in certain research. Uh -huh. uh, the unit of analysis is not usually the child; it's the classroom, possibly. And if, if this this classroom is randomly assigned, and this one is, is a control, um, but these parents aren't too excited about it. It seems that that's a constraint on participation and then a constraint on, you also express a concern about phased implementation. Yeah. That, that if, if a district's going to do something, you think enough of it to do it, you better do it for everyone. Um, do you find any dim that diminishing at all? Is that, is that becoming less of a constraint or don't, isn't that a concern? I, I think it, it, I, it's always a concern. You know, you're always balancing. If you're a policymaker or pre you know, heading the school, those are always concerns. I think there's a, uh, we're gaining some appreciation of the fact that, you know, you're experimenting when you, small e, when you change from this to that. And if we, the more we can sort of see that oftentimes changing from this to that is not getting us where we want to go, and sometimes we break the system. So one of my favorite examples of breaking the system is California did two things at once. They, 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 they glommed onto the Tennessee Star experiment findings of smaller class size, and then they went to some research on bilingual education, and they sort of did these two things at once, and they totally broke their system because they didn't have enough bilingual teachers to staff the smaller class sizes. Um, you know, who was served well by that as opposed to sort of saying, you know, this is a you know, a five-year proposition, let's do bilingual in half the schools and smaller class size in half the schools, and then we will gradually, you know, get enough teachers to round this out. And let's learn, because maybe, just maybe, um, the Tennessee tar Star experiments in one place don't generalize to California. Maybe they don't. Um, it, was, it was one study, one time, one place. Uh, instead, California did something that gave them a 
horrible headache. Um, and so I do think that there is getting to be, you know, there, there is still that knee-jerk reaction of, you know, you're going to give those kids the computers, the notebooks, but you're not going to give my kids the notebooks. Um, but, you know, if we, we all, there are always choices being made. And um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's lessening. I think the resistance is lessening. But, you know, it's still going to be there. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and the idea of things that the information that you don't know, it just seems like this conversation eliminates a lot that um, there are a lot of contextual factors that perhaps that some of the evidence that's provided by the clients might not touch on, or a lot of the nuances that some of the retail might not talk about. So, given this, is, is there a connection between the clearinghouse and the researcher um, and the work that you do? And that is there any way that the researcher gets information as to what is not known and how these things can be researched or what should be researched? As it seems that the lack of evidence could be clearly an indication that um, as researchers, we're not asking the right questions or we're not asking them in the right way. And if so, how do we relay this information or how, or how do we establish a connection between what evidence we do have and we don't have to have the Limit to the gaps that so um, that's a really good that's a really good question. How do we limit? How do, how do we know what where the big gaps are so that we can work in those fields? Um, one thing the clearinghouse uh, didn't do in the first five years and has uh, now does routinely, which is if they search for evidence on a topic and come up dry, um, they publish a null review and they will tell you that they've looked for this and there is no evidence. Um, you can also go in and easily sort of see all the places where you can search on, on uh, interventions or strategies or population groups where there is minimal evidence, you know, and that will sort of be a key, uh, you know, to, to sort of a hole um, there. Um, it's a little more nuanced when you get to things like, you know, context and stuff like that because um, that's a little more uneven. Um, one of the things that, that the clearinghouse has done, and I think the profession is sort of doing on its own too, is um, there, there is a, there's an emerging sort of, a, I think, a standard of report, design and reporting on studies. So one of the things that was published fairly recently is reporting guidelines um, for causal inference studies. So things that, that you, we, 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 and, and one of the things is we would want you to tell us you know, certain things about the context of the study. And so by t saying that up front, that triggers, you know, maybe you just, I wouldn't have thought about English language learners as being sort of something I should be noting um, because I'm so immersed in English language learners that I just sort of think this is who I study and I don't, but, but making that front and center sort of saying, yes, I should tell you whether or not I'm dealing with these population groups or these, is it urban or rural or um, older or younger, all those kinds of things. So, I, it's not perfect. I think you've, you know, it's an area to be worked on, but I think there is, I think you will find some um, evidence in here to support that. And I also think, you know, networks like this, you know, just the, you know, the, your colleagues in this room will have just a, a wealth of information that would be helpful. Uh, networking is really, uh, you know, just a, a good thing to do. Find out what others know and pick their brains. Yes? I came late, so perhaps you, you touched on it, so don't answer it if that's the case. Uh, Jeff was talking about how to create culture within policymakers, like make them be more like data driven, and, uh, and basically use evidence to support their, their, um, their new implementation. But it, it seems to me that um, we're like focusing a lot on the policymaker and not that much on the researcher in the sense of uh, oftentimes. Well, it's, it's really hard um, for uh, researchers. Like, it's, it's not that fancy to replicate a study. It's not it, that fancy to replicate the same idea in a different context. And, um, and even if you have one, one single experiment that gives you strong evidence that something is, uh, that, uh, that initiative is uh, effective, you will probably want to test it. Mm -hmm. So even the same experiment in the same study, I mean, like, just mm -hmm. as a robust check, it would be nice to, mm -hmm. to have more evidence. And um, I guess, I guess in, a, in academia, there's, I mean, like, as you were saying, like, you're not going to, no journal is going to publish, a, a, I mean, there are many journals that won't publish uh, an idea that where you have significant. Mm -hmm. 
effects, right? So um, how have you talked about how to create um, culture even within researchers of a like there might be I mean like there's there's some there's some um, definitely like some uh, uh, positive results of actually just replicating ideas. I I, yeah. I know that nobody's gonna publish the thesis and I'm <laughs> probably the but I mean like I, some, someone needs to do it. Yeah, this is this is a really important. Uh, I'm glad you raised this. I I didn't even think to 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 mention it, but. Uh, you know, sitting here in this grand uh, university, um, there is something called tenure, and it works against, it, as you say. I mean, it works. It works against some of what um, you know I, I, is important for um, creating an evidence-based um, culture and feeding it with good evidence. Because we don't, val we tend not to value null findings, negative findings or replications to the level that we do. So I, I hope and believe that some of what is going on in things like the, this project on use of evidence that W.G. Grant has been sponsoring, the, um, the IES pre-doc and post-doc programs that are sort of uh, actually rewarding um, or, or providing incentives for universities to place more value on this applied research. Um, I, I hope that that will start to change. I think in, uh, in, in some institutions it is changing the, how people think about what it takes to get, uh, to, to get tenure and to reward people and to publish um, things. There are some journals now that are much more uh, willing and, and value um, good research regardless of results, which is what it, what it should be. I mean, in, uh, in the in the hard sciences in the in the agricultural you know extension service they they would let you know if the fertilizer burned the crop you know it, I mean that would be you know there would be no question about that but in education somehow if it didn't if we don't get that positive in those stars it's you know we, did I what was I what was I doing right uh, so I, I you know I, I don't know how to accelerate this but I do hope that it is uh, changing and and it does need to um, 